Welcome to Latonia Baptist Church. Whether today is your first day to worship with us or you have been worshiping uh, with us for many years, we are thankful for you and glad that you are here. Um, this week, we will continue to worship together online uh, on Sundays at 1045 and on Wednesdays at 630. Um, one of my favorite parts of worship is being able to give. God has just blessed me in so many ways and um, it's just a joy to be able to give some something back to him and that's hard to do online but it's not impossible um, so if you still want to have the that joy of giving uh, we encourage you to mail your check to the church or to just go online to our website and you can um, give online there uh, your gifts are being used every day someone comes into the office um, in need during this time and it's just um, a joy to us that we're able to um, serve them and be able to help them and have those resources um, this week, we um, just have a couple of things that we want to tell you about. Uh, we have started sending out by email a Latonia link um, on Wednesdays or Thursdays. And that's just a way that we want to give you some more information about what is going on at the church, ways that we as a church are serving our community, and ways that you as an individual um, might be able to serve. So if you're a member or a regular attender, I mean, you did not receive that this week, then just call the church and we'll get you on the list. Finally, we are working on some plans to help our children celebrate Easter. We're going to be um, filling eggs with candy and prizes and delivering them to our children's houses along with books and some activities that will help them celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Um, our normal kids will um, get those automatically, but if you were planning to invite a family to the extravaganza and to Easter worship, um, ask them if they would like to, um, uh, to be egged. We're calling this You've Been Egged. So if they would like to be egged, you can call the church and give us their information, um, and we'd love to include them in this um, outreach time. Thank you again for being here, and uh, let's pray as we begin worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, another day to love and serve you, Lord, and to worship you. Um, Lord, we thank you for the gift of technology that allows us to worship um, even when we are in our homes. And Lord, we do thank you for connection. Many times we um, fail to realize how important that is and the gift that relationships are. Lord, we just ask you to help us during this time to to keep our focus on you, and then to see how it is that you would have us to, to live out your love in the relationships around us. Be with us as we worship and serve in our community this week. In your name we pray. Amen. right now and we invite you to sing with us the words are going to be right here behind um, us on the screen if you want to stand and and just worship with your family worship in your homes 
We are so glad that you're connected with us today. And um, amen. Lift up his name. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lives. So we
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Yeah.
Hi, my name is Dan Francis. If you're not a regular part of our uh, Facebook Live or our YouTube uh, connection, then uh, you need to know that I'm the pastor at Latonia Baptist Church, and obviously these are odd times, and so we are coming to you by way of, um, of Facebook Live. Also, if you were here last week with us, you know that uh, I'm in a series on the book of Acts, and today we're going to look at what is a reflective scripture found in chapter 11. Reflective in that we talked a lot about this scripture last week, but because the power and the emphasis and the thematic direction of the book of Acts at this point, that what we have here is, uh, sounds a bit repetitious to some folks. But let me take you back. Uh, today we're going to, the theme is marching off the map, and I'm going to take you back to a time when you first learned about maps. Uh, now, if you've got a little gray hair, you know that uh, long before we had GPSs, there was the local gas station that had maps. And the two forms they would often do that in is you would walk in, and, and sometimes they would be sponsored by uh, an, an oil company, and so they would give them out free. They give you out certain states. But by the time I started driving and started getting involved, it was much more normal to have, or at least some people thought it was normal, to have AAA. And at AAA, you would get a triptych, and you're going to see a picture of what one would look like. Now, if you've never seen that, you're probably under the age, oh, probably under the age of 40, uh, maybe even younger than that. But at triptych, you would go, I would call them and tell them that I was going to be going to Florida or somewhere. And I would, a day or so later, I would go by and I would pick up my triptych. My wife thought I was a bit of a nerd in doing that, but I loved going wherever I was going and I could just flip those pages and know exactly where I was going. They even showed you how there were heavy traffic places along the way. And so that was kind of growing up at my place. And if you reflect back upon, uh, let's just go back to the service stations again. Back then you could go in and you could get you know, they would check your oil, they would pump your gas, they would even uh, on occasion uh, put um, uh, uh, air in your tires. And now you go in, and good luck on that, uh, you get some quarters to, to fill your, uh, t your tire up, and uh, good luck on checking your oil, and you are going to, of course, pump your own gas. I think about all that because you and I have grown up in a world where we have Google Maps and you're going to see a little a logo of what is very famous across the world now, especially those that use either Google Maps or even MapQuest, one of the two of those. And so, but most of us today, we, we have, uh, you know, the idea of having a handheld GPS, our smartphone does that. And so with all the gadgetry available to us, I like what one writer said, even if you're in the middle of nowhere, you can determine that you are in fact at least somewhere. And so that's kind of the world we live in. We kind of like to, to believe that we always know where we are. And so the paper map, however, in our minds seems as though uh, it's gone by the wayside as in a black and white television or a cassette tape. But in fact, they are still holding their own. I did a little research, and the folks at Rand McNally, which is the nation's largest uh, map maker, they would tell you, we don't think paper maps are going anywhere, but rather people may be using them differently today, more of a companion to the online, or what they would call the digital map. Um, you seeing on the picture there, the Rand uh, McNally map, and it's a kind of a format that we don't see so much. However, uh, as I've studied their reasoning or what they do it for, their, their feelings are this. Uh, batteries go dead. You can spill your coffee on your GPS unit. There are moments when your signal is weak, and there is sometimes when the GPS is simply dead wrong. If you've not had that happen, then you're very, very fortunate. And so what they think is the form, the form of the map is what is going to keep them in popularity. But they also said the other important thing about all that is the context, and that is how often have you wanted to take your GPS or smartphone and see it larger, but then when as you make it larger, you lose where you are. Or So the thing that the paper map does is it always gives you a bigger context. They offer you alternate routes and a possible shortcut, 
Um, and now uh, you can even uh, get a little bit of that with the new app, the Waze map. It's been out for a while, but they can begin to show you alternative routes. You know where I'm going with all this. Uh, we're talking about literally marching off the map. And how many times have you done that with your uh, smartphone? You have turned in, you've had your uh, GPS on, and all of a sudden it starts uh, telling you in some cases that it is recalculating. And so what happens there is that it is telling you you're off where you intended to be. So uh, some of you will have this outline because we'll be sending it out to our members. But uh, there's just two or three points today. The first one is the book of Acts reads like a travelogue for the first century Christianity. Now, what we're going to get here when we read the scripture in a moment is we're going to get some geographical uh, travel going on here. It's almost like a narrative. But really what we're wanting you to do, what I'm wanting you to do is this. It's more to imagine that it's more of what I would call a spiritual uh, triptych outlining the direction that God is in fact moving the early church. So let's kind of, let me give you a back reference before we read the scripture. Peter, you remember, is going to Joppa and he eats with the Gentile uh, God-believer, Roman centurion, by the name of Cornelius, and the other, what Scripture says, the apostles and believers, they think he has literally uh, walked off of the map, and so they begin criticizing him. And so what you can imagine here is that uh, the computer, the GPS, is telling Peter, you have need to recalculate your life, and so there is this tension that we talked a little bit about last week about the circumcised Jews and those pagan Gentiles. So it's, it's chapter 11 that we're going to look at, and along the way I'll make a couple notes here, although we're going to move fairly quickly. Now the apostles, the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem and the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now, now, notice that word, eat with them. That's the problem, you know. It's one thing to say, oh, we'll accept you, but another thing to sit down at the table and to eat with them. It was an extraordinary thing for him to even imply that. And then verse 4, when Peter began to explain to them, step by step saying, now that's a word that Luke often uses. He uses it over in the gospel, and he uses it even here in Acts. But he'll talk about in an orderly fashion or a way. So what is happening here is he's trying to show God's big picture, God's big map, and that God has an orderly, progressive way in which he's showing and revealing himself, and this is going to be one of those big moments, and so we need to, clue, uh, to key into that. Verse 5, I was in the city of Java praying in a trance and in a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from the heaven being lowered by its four corners came close to me, and I looked at it closely. I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, and reptiles, and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not profane. And this happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again to heaven. And at that moment, Three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the door where we were, and the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make the distinction between them and us. And these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered in to the man's house. And the man's house, of course, is Cornelius. And Cornelius told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, and he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began, Peter began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had been upon the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. Now he said to me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And here's some really important lines. And if God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God. And then eight, verse 18, when they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. 
So what are we reading here? The book of Acts is a kind of travelogue. Secondly, God provides a map with a larger context or a view. God is providing a map. The other apostles and believers only saw this narrow route that God had revealed to them. Somebody has even called it the Old Testament or the Old GPS, the Genesis to Prophets Scriptures. And it was the route that they were used to seeing God and knowing God. And it was the way of the law and that God's chosen people as the Jews. But now here, Peter explains to them that God had showed him the context of a much larger map that revealed a new road to them. And so the context shows that Peter came in from this dream that he had with this large sheet full of animals and that God commands Peter essentially to, to, to march off the maps that he had trusted all of his life. And so, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And so, that was earth-shattering, earth-shattering to him. So, God was carving out what we would call a new route that would bring together Jews and Gentiles. God, in fact, doesn't just give Peter a map, but he gives him a directive, a direction from the Spirit of God that guides him to Caesarea. And so because Peter's now walking off of the familiar place, the map that he had always trusted, it was like going into a a gas station back then and not just simply getting one of the the maps off of the the wall that has Ohio and Kentucky or wherever it is that you live, but you literally were looking over at the wall where in some gas stations they literally had a large, large map of the whole world. So suddenly this small map that he had was going to be expanded and things were going to be radically different. So, I've got a picture here that I found, and I, I look forward to one with, with men in it too, but you won't really actually see the men, but I read the story, and I did a little research to find out, it was back in uh, about 2011, three women had rented, and part of the things may have been they were trusting a GPS they weren't familiar with, but they had rented a really nice SUV, and they were at a Costco convention, evidently, in Washington State. And so they had fed in the instructions, and they really were doing what I had done the other night. We were going to a place, and I was watching my GPS, and I was saying, okay, it's time to turn, it's time to turn. By the time I got there, when I was starting to turn, I hadn't been looking around to see if there were cars coming. So I have an idea it was something like that that happened. What you see there, if you look really close at the picture, is the SUV is literally sunk into the water. Now, nobody was hurt. Uh, they got out of that fine, but there was obviously a lot of embarrassment. So what is the larger context that God is showing you and me today? And that's where we'll spend our time. What is it that he wants us to see? He wants us to see something bigger, something larger. And so I began to think, uh, a place that I have not been to, but I read about, and I fully intend to go, to go there. It's a place in, I think it's eastern part of uh, California, and it's called the Death Valley National Monument. I've been reading an article about it, and it's a crazy kind of place because uh, you can almost experience anything there. It's a land of beautiful yet dangerous, what we call extremes, located in eastern California. For instance, the mountains can range as high as what they said, 3,000 meters, which is about two miles high. And then you have the storms and the mountains, which cause all kinds of flooding. And then the temperature fluctuates radically. It can go up to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And one of the guys that uh, is a ranger in that area said he has had to literally rescue numerous people, tourists there, because they went into the desert thinking their GPS was always going to respond positively. He says, out there, you can have a small map on a screen, and if you don't have the bigger picture, you can get lost and not know that you're on a dirt road for 75 miles going in the wrong direction. I couldn't help but think of my um, kind of mentor in the ministry, uh, Fred Craddock, this week. These are incredibly unusual times, and I remember... Fred used to tell uh, the story of how he would uh, came to know the Lord and as a young man. He would go to the Christian camp that he and he would go there to get encouraged and 
and he would hear missionaries speak, and he said he'd always wondered, you know, I, that he was now that he had surrendered his heart to the Lord and that God had touched his life, that he wanted to be like one of those great missionaries he heard. And he often said it as a young man, he would wonder, I wonder if they'll make a monument to me. And there he would he would stand, standing by my monument, Fred's monument, Mabel would notice that and take a picture of it. He said it was awesome. As he grew older, he realized that that's not how Jesus did this thing. Most of us think this call to follow Jesus will be in this kind of startling moment that we'll shed our old life and the new life will just be so powerfully different that we'll never look back. But the truth is, and he knew this and I know it, and you do too, most of the time it doesn't happen that way. It's as if we've been given what he would call a million dollars. And we think that we have to spend it all at once on something big. The reality is we give away our life and we give away that million dollars every day, all day, in a little amount, a quarter at a time is what he said. He said we give it away in little acts of sacrifice and kindness to others and devotion to God. We listen to the neighbor kids' problems. We spend some time with a homeless shelter. We give a cup of water to a man whose hands are shaking in a nursing home. We treat the teenager in the drive through restaurant, whether he deserves it or not, we treat him with respect. And the list goes on, he said, and usually giving our lives to Christ is neither glorious or spectacular. It's done little acts of love and kindness, 25 cents at a time. The living the Christian life, little by little, day after day. And I'll never forget, Fred looking at his audience and saying, you got a quarter. In this time in which you and I are living, we are giving in small pockets the best we can for the moment that we have. Let me give you how God is speaking to my GPS and recalculating my life right now. Recalculating, what is God doing in this, what is likely to be the most frightening, fearful time that most of us will ever live in. What does it mean? He's recalculating for us what it means to be alive or not. He's recalculating what it means to be valuable or not. He's recalculating what it means to be humble or not. He's recalculating what it means to be expendable or not. He's calculating what it means to have hope or not. I'm going to end with two people that I've given a quarter to today. You know, just a quarter of a piece of my life. In the last 24 hours, I've talked with a lady that's living in her car in the corner of our parking lot. We've called the police department and told them that, they would, that she would be there so she would not be bothered. Why would we do that? Well, she is not allowed, nor is anybody else allowed to be in the homeless shelter here locally because somebody tested positive for the virus. And so she's been in quarantine for 14 days. She has four more days to go. I was walking out of my car this morning, coming into the office. I waved to her, and she beeped her horn and told me, Pastor Dan, you are an angel. Huh. Hardly. But I gave a quarter, you see. I gave a little bit of something that matters to her. Yesterday, a FaceTime message came in for me to pray with a man not much younger than me, who just discovered he has stage four cancer. And they're going to be taking him to Chicago because that's the only place right now that can get him the kind of treatment that he needs. The cancer is in his brain, in his lung, and likely in his liver. What can we do? In times like this, when God's recalculating our lives, we can just give a little bit. And you've heard it said, a little bit of God goes a long way, sure. It's a nice little saying, but the reality is in the days that we live, it's true. Got a quarter? Go out and give it yourself somehow to somebody. Let's pray. Father, in the days, weeks, in the strangest year we'll likely ever live in our lives, we pray that you will recalculate our lives our ministries, our churches, our communities, and yes, our world. There will no longer be just different parties 
or different churches. We'll be people. People that are full of grace and who offer that grace and who live in the redeeming mission of God. That's our hope. Hear it. Father, as we pray it today, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I hope to see you soon. Oh God.